something that I know is on the minds of everyone here in this country. Confusion, mayhem, that's the only way I can describe it. Obamacare. We have got uh, Senator Mike Lee with us. Senator Mike Lee serves uh, in the great state of Utah uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee, a ranking member of the Antitrust Competition Policy and Consumer Rights Subcommittee. And uh, Senator Mike Lee uh, has a lot to say about this Obamacare stuff. And a wonderful conservative, Senator uh, Lee, welcome to today's issues. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you. Uh, Senator, you've written a, a a trenchant critique of the of the John Roberts Supreme Court decision called "Why John Roberts Was Wrong About Health Care." Now we're we're just on the cusp of Obamacare rolling out. It appears it, it feels like it's almost inevitable. I want to ask you if it is, but before I get to that question, let's go back to the Supreme Court decision. Uh, remind our listeners what did the what did the John Roberts Supreme Court decide about the Obamacare case? Well, the whole reason I decided to write Why John Roberts Was Wrong About Healthcare, which is an ebook you can buy it for less than four dollars anywhere ebooks are sold, uh, is because I was there when this case was argued in the Supreme Court, and I was there the day it was announced. And then I poured over the written opinion, uh, uh, spent many hours reading it. The more I read it, the more I realized that this was a really bad day, a really sad day for America, not just because it resulted in the decision upholding Obamacare in the highest court of the land, but also because of the way in which that happened. Chief Justice Roberts, apparently having switched his vote just a few weeks before the decision was handed down, essentially rewrote two key aspects of the Obamacare law that were essential to the challenge, the constitutional challenge in that case. And effectively what happened was that a majority of the Supreme Court felt that two aspects of Obamacare were unconstitutional as they were written, as they were enacted in law by Congress. They were able to save those only by effectively rewriting them. And so I wrote why John Roberts was wrong about health care in order to explain to all Americans that what happened here was not just a bad policy decision, not just a disappointing ruling from a policy standpoint, uh, but more importantly, that it was a very sad day for America because this was a moment at which our justices actually rewrote the law and they have no power to do that, and that was wrong. Senator, how in the world could this happen? I mean, it seems like in just basic civics you learn in, in, in high school that the legislature makes the law and the Supreme Court decides it on the basis of what the Constitution says. How could they effectively rewrite a law that Congress had passed? Well, they did it because they could do it, in the sense that they could do it and get away with it. Because of the fact that they are the highest court in the land, uh, they purport to have the final word when it comes to issues of constitutionality arising in the context of federal litigation. But the fact that they have that final word doesn't make their rulings necessarily right, Uh, nor does it mean that the American people shouldn't expect more. In fact, I think the American people must demand more, and they need to do it through their elected representatives in Congress. They need to stand up, and and those of us who recognize that this was a lawless uh, violation of the Constitution need to demand that their members of Congress stand up to the law, refuse to fund it, and do everything in their power to repeal it. You know, Senator, I know it's hard to get inside the, the, the head of somebody else, but you've got a little a, a chapter in your ebook called What Happened to Chief Justice Roberts? As far as you can tell, why did he switch his vote? As far as I can tell, he was the subject of a lot of criticism, what I call anticipatory criticism. Uh, from people on the left who correctly surmised that he was leaning strongly toward voting with the court's conservatives and finding this law unconstitutional. And according to leaked press accounts, uh, that is, in fact, what happened. He initially voted with conservatives and was inclined and preparing to strike the law down. But along the way, I I noticed in May, uh, in April and May, of 2012. 
after the case had been argued and submitted to the court, but before the court publicly rendered its ruling. Uh, there was an increased and unusual amount of criticism coming from Democrats in the House and the Senate and the White House, attacking Chief Justice Roberts, calling him an activist, saying that if he participated in any ruling invalidating Obamacare, that he would be an, act an activist justice, and that this would forever tarnish his uh, reputation in history. Uh, unfortunately, those attacks appear to have had their intended effect. Now, I want to make clear, I have no way of reading Chief Justice Roberts' mind. Uh, I think the only one who can tell us exactly why he did what he did is him. But there is abundant circumstantial evidence suggesting that he succumbed to public pressure, public pressure that was added to by the mainstream media in this country, which is overwhelmingly and unabashedly leftist. Uh, pressure that wrongly and anticipatorily accused him of being an activist for being inclined to invalidate Obamacare. Oddly, interestingly enough, and ironically, what ended up happening was he became an activist by going out of his way to save this law, by rewriting it, not just once, but twice. We're talking with Senator Mike Lee from Utah. He is the author of an ebook, a fairly short ebook, I should say. It's it's a it's a good read and one you can read fairly quickly. And I recommend it to all of our listeners. Called "Why John Roberts Was Wrong About Health Care." As we come to the end of the ebook, you've got a little chapter there called "Where Do We Go From Here?" Now we're <laughs> two weeks out from these state exchanges. I guess the question I have for you, Senator, is it too late or could Obamacare be either defunded or changed somehow? It's not too late. Uh, first of all, it's never too late in the sense that the people uh, hold the power in this country. We are the sovereigns, not the government. We can repeal a law once it's been passed, even after it's been rewritten and wrongfully invalidated by the Supreme Court. We always retain that power. I do insist, however, that if we allow this law to take effect, as is currently scheduled to happen, uh, that it will become increasingly difficult to get rid of it, because it, this amounts to a massive new entitlement program, and our history in this country uh, reflects the fact that we virtually never repeal a major new entitlement program once it kicks in. So what I've been encouraging people to do is to contact their members of Congress, their senators and their representatives, and to tell them in no uncertain terms that we should not fund Obamacare, and in fact we should go out of our way to defund Obamacare. Uh, there are other things that we can do, of course, uh, other things that I recommend in my book, including uh, supporting legislation that I've introduced, uh, Senate Bill 560 which would require members of Congress uh, to recognize whether or not the individual mandate is, in fact, backed up by a tax or a penalty. Uh, that's one of the things that John Roberts rewrote in this law, is that he took what was written as a penalty and turned it into a tax, thus making it constitutional as he dressed up the law, as he rewrote it. But in the immediate term, what we need right now is for members of Congress to pass legislation that would keep everything else in government funded, um, but defund Obamacare. Currently, there's legislation moving through the House of Representatives, legislation introduced by Representative Tom Graves from Georgia that would do precisely that, and we need Congress to pass that, and we need the president to sign that into law. Senator Mike Lee from Utah is our guest here on today's issues. Senator, can you tell me um, your thoughts on that recent meeting uh, with the White House and President Obama with these... Um union leaders, that they were pretty upset about Obamacare and what that whole situation was all about and your, your, your reaction to that, that meeting that took place? Sure. I, first of all, this meeting that took place at the White House just a, a few days ago uh, in some ways is reminiscent of, in some ways typifies the fact that almost everyone in America uh, is being threatened by this law in one way or another. Uh, doctors hate it because it restricts their ability to practice medicine. Employers hate it because it's likely to force them to fire employees and in other circumstances to uh, reduce the hours of other employees so as to avoid the harsh employer mandate in the law. Uh, American families 
fear it because 57% of American families recognize that this law will make their family's health care situation worse, not better, uh, because of, among other things, sharply increasing health care premiums. And unions, last and not least, uh, also dislike it, even though most of them supported the law when it was moving through Congress. As James Hoffa, the head of the Teamsters Union, recently said, uh, that this law, if implemented, as it's scheduled to be implemented, uh, will effectively destroy the 40-hour work week in America, which has become the backbone of the American economy. And so the unions are perhaps the latest major group to join in the growing chorus of Americans on both sides of the political spectrum that have recognized that in one way or another this law is bad for them. The appropriate response in this circumstance is for Congress to recognize that what the president has already told us he's not going to follow the law. If he's not going to follow the law, and if we know, as we do, that this law is going to make health care worse and less affordable for most Americans, Congress needs to stop the law. The best way, the last best chance that we can stop this law before it kicks in is for Congress to defund it. And that's what the Graves bill would do. And uh, I want to congratulate Representative Graves and the House Republican leadership, including Eric Cantor and Speaker of the House John Boehner, for their willingness to bring the Graves legislation forward in the coming days and pass that out of the House of Representatives. If that happens, Senator, and it comes out of the House and goes to the Senate, is there a chance it could pass through the Senate, do you think? I think that it should pass through the Senate. Uh, most people would predict, as of right now, that the Senate being controlled by Democrats by a margin of 54 to 46 currently, uh, that the president's party will stand with the president and refuse to pass uh, this provision because it defunds Obamacare. Uh, that is conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom does not, however, take into account what can be accomplished when the American people get behind something. I have seen during my short two and a half years so far in the United States Senate, many legislative proposals have their face changed as the American people weigh in overwhelmingly, either for or against something. And that's why I'd invite all within the sound of my voice, all of your listeners out there, all of you who love freedom, all of you who value your health care, your existing relationship you have with your insurance company, your doctor, and with other health care providers, all who fear Obamacare with good reason to join with me in this cause uh, and, and to help me in this effort to defund Obamacare. You can go to a website that we've set up. It's called don'tfundit.com and sign a petition. Add your name to the list of almost 1.4 million Americans who have signed this petition just in the last few weeks since we've set it up. And then call your senators and your representatives and tell them to pass the grace legislation. And then tell 10 of your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues, your aunts, your uncles, to do the same thing. But we've got uh, less than two weeks left to take care of this. I need your help. I need the help of your listeners. So please join me in this noble cause. Go to don'tfundit.com and help me help Congress defund Obamacare. All right, again, that website again, Senator? It's don'tfundit.com. Don't. Don'tfundit.com. Okay, don'tfundit.com. You're listening to today's issues, and we've got Senator Mike Lee uh, from Utah with us here. Uh, so, Senator, uh, on, on the Supreme Court side, now that they have decided, there's no further legal challenge that's going to be accepted uh, to Obamacare, is there? Well, that part's not certain. Look, this is a 2,700-page law, and the 2,700-page law has already been supplemented by an astounding 20,000 pages of implementing regulations. Uh, and, and so... This much law will necessarily generate all kinds of litigation for many years to come. Some of that litigation will almost inevitably involve constitutional challenges. So, no, I, I would not say that this represents the end of the road as far as any constitutional challenge to Obamacare. It does, however, represent the end to uh, the constitutional challenges that were specifically involved in this case. 